the most cheerful philosopher, maybe in the history of philosophy, the most cheerful philosopher in, in the book is, uh, is David Hume. And Hume is a fascinating example because um, Hume is an atheist and dies as an atheist. Adam Smith, um, in a, a correspondence with Hume's doctor, um, the word that keeps coming up in that exchange is cheerfulness. Hume's good humour. Hume's humour. Hume's, Hume's cheerfulness. And he was visited on, on two occasions by James Boswell, who was uh, Samuel Johnson's biographer. Because Boswell was offended that Hume was going to go to his death as an atheist. He didn't believe that Hume could go to his death as a, as a, as a non-believer. And Hume good-humouredly uh, admitted him, uh, they talked, and Hume persisted in his, in his belief. But he wasn't, he wasn't mean to Boswell. And uh, at a certain point, it, it's recorded somewhere that um, Boswell said to Hume, you know, do you not at least conceive of the possibility that the soul is immortal? And um, Hume said in response, if I throw a piece of coal on the fire, it is possible that it will not burn. Right? And that's as close as he... <laughs> and, and so Hume, I wouldn't say is uh, necessarily an optimist, but he, he goes to his death cheerfully. For me, there's a correlation between cheerfulness and pessimism. You know, it's, it's the pessimist who is the, the person who, who's cheerful. I have, if you like, Nietzschean worries about optimism. Optimism is usually bound up with an idea of the future being better than things are now, which I think is, is a risky thing to, to believe. For me, it's about uh, a philosophical disposition is about embracing a certain pessimism that is not negative, but which is a condition for uh, cheerfulness and affirmation. I would, I would maybe go for Epicurus. Epicurus is, is what he calls the tetrapharmakos, the four-part cure. Um, don't fear death. Don't fear God. What is good is easy to get. And what is difficult, what is painful is easy to endure. What, that thought is very interesting. The idea that one should not fear death, I've already, I've already talked about. You know, the, the, the point of being Epicurean is to accept the fact of one's death cheerfully without a longing for, the, for immortality, a longing for the afterlife. Don't fear God. Well, there was no sort of big, angry, vengeful God in, for the Epicureans. God was somewhere out there, but it wasn't really terribly important. What is... What is good is easy to get, and what is painful is easy to endure. When most people think about Epicurus and Epicureanism, they think of someone who's committed to pleasure. It's completely wrong. Um, when Epicurus was asked what would give him pleasure, he said a barley cake and a cup of water. Maybe with a pot of cheese every now and then, and that would be more than sufficient. What it means to be an Epicurean is to minimize one, one's pleasures and to focus on them as genuine pleasures. And if you minimize your pleasures, you also minimize your pains. So the problem, if you like, the crisis that, you know, that we're confronted with now is a crisis caused by excessive, excessive pleasures, the cultivation of excessive pleasures. So paradoxically, a time of crisis like this might be one in which people can learn to minimize their pleasures and actually be happier in a strange way. You know, points of, points of crisis can be philosophically interesting, you know. Um, we, I mean, people were obviously living through some sort of dreadful delusion these last years about the future and about the endless uh, uh, opportunities and possibilities of the future. Uh, a lot of that has gone. That is an interesting philosophical moment. When that bubble is popped, you're left with you know, you're left with yourself and facing up to yourself. You can run away into religion, if you like. That's a consolation, but it's a false consolation. You know, when I was talking earlier about the need to um, embrace the transient and never-occurring present 
and that is the only eternity that's available to us. I think that's something which um, is very important. You don't need money to do that, right? You don't need you, you don't need a a crazy luxurious lifestyle to do that. In many ways, you know, one of the interesting things you can learn from the history of philosophy is the importance of um, of poverty. Right? The philosophers were often poor. Diogenes, you know, threw away threw away his cup when he saw someone uh, drinking with their hands. Right? Why do I need that cup? Right? I, I could live without it. So in many ways, you know, uh, philosophy isn't isn't a, a luxury add-on to culture for me. It's something which can allow one to accept, you know, that, that less is more in a strange way. Mm -hmm.